my mother-in-law's scheme to take over my life after my husband died. It was a quiet evening when the phone call came. I was tucking my children, Maya and Ethan, into bed, trying to maintain some semblance of normalcy since my husband, Ivor, had passed away six months ago. The house was eerily silent, the absence of Ivor's laughter and warmth palpable. As I kissed Maya goodnight, my phone buzzed on the bedside table. The number was unfamiliar, and the voice on the other end was even more so. Mrs. Anderson, there's something you need to know about your husband's death. The line went dead, leaving me with a racing heart and a sense of impending doom. Life without Ivor had been an unending struggle. Our home, once filled with joy, now felt empty and cold. My mother-in-law Catherine had always been a domineering presence, but since Ivor's death, her visits had become more frequent and increasingly intrusive. She was a woman used to getting her way, and her stern demeanor left little room for negotiation. On a particularly bleak afternoon, Catherine arrived unannounced, her face set in a grim expression. She marched into the living room without so much as a greeting, her eyes scanning the room critically. Lorn, we need to talk about the house and the children, she said abruptly. I looked up from the paperwork I was sorting through, trying to keep my voice steady. What about them, Catherine? It's clear that you're struggling, she said, her tone cold. I think it's best if I take over the management of Ivor's estate, including the house and the children's future. My heart sank. What are you saying, Catherine? This is our home. These are my children's futures. Catherine's eyes hardened. You're not capable of handling this on your own. Ivor would have wanted me to help. Catherine wasted no time. She produced a stack of documents from her bag and laid them on the coffee table. These papers will transfer control of the estate to me. It's a simple process, really. All you need to do is sign. I stared at the papers, my mind reeling. Why would I sign these? Mother left everything to me and the kids. Catherine's eyes narrowed. Lorne, you're grieving. You're not thinking clearly. This is for the best. Anger and confusion battle within me. I need time to think about this. Don't take too long, she snapped. These matters need to be resolved quickly. As soon as Catherine left, I called my best friend and trusted lawyer, Rachel. She arrived within the hour, her face set in a determined expression as she reviewed the documents. Lorne, these papers would give Catherine complete control over everything, Rachel said, her voice tight with anger. You'd be left with nothing. I felt a wave of nausea. Why would she do this? Why now? Because she thinks she can get away with it, Rachel replied. But we're not going to let her. Determined to protect my children's future, I started my own investigation. Late at night, after Maya and Ethan were asleep, I would sit at Ivor's old desk and sift through his financial records. I discovered several large withdrawals from our joint account, all made in the weeks leading up to Ivor's death. The money had been transferred to an account I didn't recognize. I confronted Catherine the next day. Why are you transferring money from our account? She didn't even blink. I was helping Ivor manage his finances. He was making poor decisions. Poor decisions? Or decisions you didn't agree with? I shot back. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Feeling increasingly uneasy, I hired a private investigator, Mr. Harrison, to look into the circumstances of Ivor's death and the financial irregularities. Weeks passed with no news, and my anxiety grew with each passing day. Then, one evening, Mr. Harrison called. Lorn, we need to meet. I found something you need to see. We met at a quiet cafe where he handed me a folder. Inside was a copy of a new will, drafted just weeks before Ivor's death, naming Catherine as the sole beneficiary. My hands shook as I read the document. This can't be real. Ivor would never do this. It's not real, Mr. Harrison said grimly. It's a forgery, and there's more. Mr. Harrison's investigation revealed a series of damning details. Ivor's death, initially ruled an accident, now seemed suspicious. There were discrepancies in the police report and witnesses who claimed to have seen another car at a scene, a car that matched the description of Catherine's vehicle. I felt like the ground was shifting beneath me. Are you saying Catherine might have been involved in Ivor's death? It's a possibility we can't ignore, Mr. Harrison replied. We need more evidence. Desperate to uncover the truth, I decided to confront Catherine one last time. This time, I recorded our conversation with a hidden camera. I invited her over, pretending to be ready to sign the documents she had presented. 
Catherine, before I sign, I need to know something. I began, keeping my voice steady. Did you have anything to do with Iva's death? Her reaction was immediate. Her face turned pale, and for a brief moment, I saw fear in her eyes. Then she composed herself. How do you accuse me of such a thing? I love my son. Then why is there evidence suggesting otherwise? I asked, pushing the folder toward her. Why is there a forged will and why were you at the scene of the accident? She stood up abruptly, her chair scraping against the floor. You're out of your mind. I'm leaving. The evidence I had gathered, along with Mr. Harrison's findings, was enough to take the case to court. The legal battle that followed was grueling. Catherine fought viciously, her lawyers attacking my character and my competence as a mother. But Rachel was relentless. She presented the forged will, the suspicious financial transactions, and the inconsistencies in the police report. She also called witnesses who testified to seeing Catherine's car near the scene of Ivor's accident. The court ruled in my favor. Catherine was ordered to return the stolen funds, and a criminal investigation into her involvement in Ivor's death was launched. The legal victory brought some relief, but it didn't erase the pain of losing Ivor or the betrayal by someone I had once considered family. The months that followed were filled with healing and rebuilding. I focused on Maya and Ethan, ensuring they felt loved and secure despite the turmoil. I also sought therapy to help process my grief and the trauma of the past year. Slowly, our home became a place of peace and healing once more. I redecorated, adding touches that reflected our new life without Ivor, while still honoring his memory. One afternoon as I was sorting through Ivor's belongings, I found a letter addressed to me, written in his familiar handwriting. My heart raced as I opened it. Dear Lorne, if you're reading this, it means I'm no longer with you. I've written this letter because there are things you need to know, things I couldn't tell you while I was alive. I've always known that Catherine could be manipulative. Recently, I discovered she's been taking money from our accounts. I confronted her, but she convinced me she was only trying to protect us. I didn't believe her, but I couldn't prove anything at the time. I've taken out a life insurance policy and named you as the beneficiary. If anything happens to me, know that I loved you and the kids more than anything. Be strong, my love. Protect our family. All my love, Ivor. Tears streamed down my face as I read Ivor's words. He had known. He had tried to protect us, even from beyond the grave. His love and foresight gave me the strength to move forward. With Catherine out of our lives and the truth finally revealed, we began to heal as a family. Maya and Ethan thrived in their new routine, and I found solace in my work and the support of friends and family. I also reached out to others who had faced similar challenges, sharing my story in hopes of helping them navigate their own struggles. It wasn't easy, but knowing that Ivor's legacy lived on in the love and strength of our family brought me peace. Years later, I stood in the backyard, watching Maya and Ethan play under the oak tree Ivor had planted when we first moved into the house. The sun filtered through the leaves, casting dappled light on their laughing faces. Our home, months under threat, now stood as a testament to resilience and love. We had faced betrayal and loss, but we had emerged stronger, united by the memory of Ivor and the truth that had set us free. Catherine was eventually convicted of fraud and embezzlement. She spent several years in prison, and though I harbored no ill will towards her, I was relieved that justice had been served. Other spirit remained with us, guiding us through the tough times and reminding us of the power of love and integrity. As I looked at my children, I knew that we would be okay. We had each other, and that was enough.